Grande Melbeck were the co-chair of uh, the session uh, uh, 10 uh, in, uh, in Palermo, session 11, understanding the food environment in the Mediterranean, interlinkage between sustainable diet and sustainable food system, and they are in the document and then the, the session main findings. And today will be associated with the output from the web dialogue number one that was held last week. Thanks, Gianluca, to run the, the web. Okay, thank you very much, Sandro. Um, actually, as it was explained in the, in, in the invitation, uh, this uh, conversation today is aimed at uh, uh, let's say, making more precise the uh, outputs of the conference in Palermo and to identify some principles and some, uh, let's say, um, uh, issues that can be taken in the next uh, steps of this process of, uh, uh, let's say, of uh, writing a, a strategy for Mediterranean diets and sustainable uh, diets. Uh, maybe you have uh, uh, on your screen or uh, in, in your uh, view uh, the outcomes of the Palermo conference and especially session 11 and uh, um, uh, session se 7 uh, with some points uh, that could be uh, the, the starting point for discussion so maybe uh, if you agree, uh, I don't know if it is possible uh, for the conveners to share the screen with everybody so we can have a look at them and then we start a discussion. <coughs> Dove posso andare per... Sì. Sì. Ok. So, this is uh, the document that uh, Sandro circulated. As you can see, uh, there are two expected outputs. Uh, the first uh, one is the identification of a converging points of view and common action and aggregating them into priority and transformative actions. Uh, and the second, uh, the identification in uh, case of uh, relevant precedent. So after having a, a first read of them, uh, we should uh, look at two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, what are the points which you think most important and urgent and why? Uh, so we can uh, give also some uh, references or specific evidence. points and by whom? So I see that there are some people uh, uh, joining in, uh, in the second moment, so maybe it would be to have uh, a very short uh, uh, round of uh, presentations. What do you think, Sandro? Yes, I think it would be good if we can uh, very briefly introduce uh, each other so we know who, who are uh, participating. Okay, maybe you can start uh, in that room uh, in which I see at least four people. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Dalia Mattioni. I think I may know most of you. Uh, I'm working in FAO on the Market Linkages and Value Chains team in the Nutritional Food Systems Division, and I've worked on the food retail environment. So the way that food retailers are officially organized in cities and the impact that this has on their dietary patterns. And I also contributed to the session that Gianluca spearheaded in, in Palermo. So, happy to be here. Okay, thank you, Dalia. Then uh, we can uh, continue with the round. Yes, uh, Florence Egal. Uh, I have been involved in the Palermo Conference and related issues for quite a while. Okay, thank you. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, Jose Valls. I'm, I work in the food systems program here at FAO and working precisely in this uh, initiative with uh, CIAM and UF UFM on this multi-stakeholder platform for the Mediterranean. Okay, thank you very much. Then we can move to the next room. I see a DL room somewhere. I don't know where. DL room. DL, uh, DL room is Amid El Bilali. Ah, okay. He's a researcher of uh, Siambari and is also the reporter of uh, this meeting, this uh, uh, dialogues, uh, web dialogues. Uh, I continue with uh, the Siambari and uh, I'm Gianluigi Cardone, agriculture economist. He works uh, about uh, the food systems and I uh, particularly about uh, sustainable issues. And uh, I presented, uh, um, I was presented uh, in uh, Palermo about uh, uh, my presentation on enhancing uh, sustainability of diet quality typical agro-food products uh, as a cornerstone of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, in this case, uh, I uh, presented uh, the case study of Apulia uh, about sustainability in uh, linked to the product quality of Apulia uh, to the valorization of the typical uh, traditional products. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Luigi Sisto, the responsible of ICT development of Siambari, and also <coughs> I'm the coordinator, technological coordinator of this, uh, this web meeting. Thank you very much. Then we have Giampiero. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having involved me in this very nice conversation and i'm sorry but i didn't i don't have uh, a webcam on my screen so i cannot use it um anyway i'm a phd candidate in landscape and environment i study urban food policies uh, and i'm involved in the planning and uh, monitoring of uh, two uh, local food policies in uh, in Italy, and I am in the technical secretariat of uh, Italian Network on Local Food. I'm an agrarian uh, economist too. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know. I see a new uh, face uh, in the room at FAO. FAO. Uh, hello, hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Wherever you are. My name is Divine Njie. I am the, the deputy leader of FAO's strategic program on food systems. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have uh, to tell you that... Uh, Alexander. In... Sorry? There is Alexander. Ah, where is Alexander? I don't see him. Yes. Ah, okay. Alexander, can you introduce yourself? I'm having trouble connecting to the internet. Okay. Okay. You, have, uh, you, have to, you have to start with, uh, with uh, audio. Click on start audio, please. Yeah. Ah, okay. uh, hello, good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, I've cut my audio because there, there are lots of various noises from all those that are not talking and it makes it quite difficult to understand. Um, so I was in Palermo, I, I co-chaired uh, the session on food environment with, with Gianluca and also made uh, an intervention on landscape and diet. I'm working in the food trees and agroforestry research program of the CGIR, and so which explains my main interest now on the interaction between food systems in a broad sense and diets and their nutritional outcomes. Thank you very much. And then uh, I see on my screen uh, Milena Stefan Stefanova, who has not the, the webcam, but I suppose she is here. Milena, are you with us? Yes. 
can you hear me? Yes, well, we, we can hear, but don't, don't see you. Please, ah, if I'm you sorry. click on click on start the video, we can see also. I'm sorry, but uh, my PC that I'm using in this moment doesn't have a video camera, so I have right. A uh, okay, okay. So sorry for that. Um, but I'm uh, Milena Stefanova from um, uh, Enea, an Italian uh, Technological Research Institute, and. Um, uh, I have been involved indirectly in the Palermo conference on the topic of uh, sustainability assessments and uh, I'm working on the role of information and the way it can shape communication patterns while uh, uh, people speak about sustainability and what is sustainable food or sustainable diet. Okay, thank you very much Milena. So I think we can start. Uh, I have to, to tell you that uh, I will leave you uh, at about uh, 2.10. So I hope that Sandro or Alexander will be able to, to continue moderating this, uh, this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, I, I would start uh, with the reading uh, this, uh, the, the main findings of the Palermo conference, if you agree. Uh, so, uh, if, yes, we can start from point one. The point one is that recognition of food as a multidimensional issue, calling for systemic approach to look at a variety of interconnections at the plurality of outcomes of a food system. The second um, point is that, that there is very often too much emphasis on food and not enough on people. The notion of food environment invites precisely to focus on people on their interface to food. The concept of food environment that embodies the material, social and symbolic determinants of consumer behavior is worth exploring. The third point is uh, building a food environment that supports healthy eating practices requires change in surrounding conditions. Lack of access to healthy food is the result of decisions of multiple actors. It cannot be addressed only by very narrow interventions, but requires transformative practice that confront inequalities. The identification of the food deserts is illustrative of this approach. It requires, however, to go further, to realize that they are themselves the outcomes of the broader socioeconomic drivers. Space is the product of complex social relations. A fifth point, uh, we need to go beyond the rational choice theory to understand people and their social practices. Practice itself depends on material determinants, competencies, and meanings. In that regard, retail does have an influence mediated by material and immaterial determinants on dietary intake. Places matter. Uh, point six, uh, as shown by the example of Tunisia, globalization is changing food practices. There are also trends towards more proximity between consumers and producers. And one example is the development of short food supply chains in France, defined as having not more than one intermediary. 52% of population uses them for an estimated 10-15% of food expenditures expected to grow to 20-25% in 10 years. The ex example of a scheme linking sustainability and quality of products in the region of Apulia and Italy with the objective to communicate the information to consumers raises the critical question of the food practices of consumers buying such types of products and to what extent such a scheme could multiply them. Point seven, among the major changes between the traditional and modern model in Tunisia have been noted the change of attitude towards seafood from aversion to social valorization a strong increase in the consumption of poultry, eggs, dairy products, sweets, the reduction of meals from three or two 
or even one accompanied by the development of nibbling, the apparition and development of eating out that now concerns all meals. Point eight, transition have been described in consumption pattern for consumers starting to buy in short food supply chains towards an increase of fresh food and vegetables, a reduction of meat after an initial increase. They seem to be driven by three mechanisms, learning, self-promotion, esteem, and social control. Point nine, a general observation was that eating out is a missed opportunity. It could provide numerous opportunity to change food practices. Uh, can you go, yes, ah, okay, this is the, the points of, uh, um, of uh, uh, the, the previous session and the other session. Um, yes, is uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, sorry, Sandra, what, what are these points that we see on the screen now? I think we can, uh, yeah, you can stop. Uh, let's yes, I think we can stop yeah. here for the moment. Yeah, we can stop it. Then we see how we, we move or respect the output of a previous, uh, because time is very short. So let's try to reduce this shopping list to give like a sense of which are the main, uh, main point that you would like to discuss. And also, especially if there are estimate of percentage, uh, where they come from, uh, on uh, which are the scientific evidence of 10-15 percent of food expenditure, for example, expected to grow 20-25 in 10 years, from where they come from, for example, a story like that. Okay, so I think that we can uh, to start discussing these points. Uh, uh, as a general uh, comment, uh, I can see here that uh, we need, uh, uh, let's say, a key concept that uh, is uh, able to unify uh, some of these points. And I think that uh, one way of, uh, of reasoning is uh, uh, the building uh, uh, territorial food systems. Uh, inspired to the principles of sustainable diets because we are speaking about uh, uh, individual behavior but we are uh, talking about uh, retailing we are talking about eating out uh, we are talking about the short food supply chains and uh, actually strategies to um, let's say to pursue sustainable diets uh, could be based on a strategic thinking of uh, urban and territorial food systems. But uh, I would like now to, to give the words to those who would like to, to speak and to comment. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I'm pretty good at starting the ball rolling when nobody wants to talk, I always want to talk. Three, three dimensions, I think, uh, this issue of eating out as a missed opportunity, there has been a lot of work done on street foods, maybe some time ago. Um, also, eating out has very much, in the Mideast area at least, been the normal way of eating. Uh, nobody would think about closing themselves in a small room to eat uh, in four or five people. Actually, uh, eating in the street and having a collective way of eating was part of the culture and which we could, should therefore take into account, but also maybe rebuild, in particular in urban contexts where you have a lot of migration and you have a, a problem with um, social networks. So it would be a good opportunity to think about that. The second dimension, there is quite a lot of work done in particular in uh, Egypt and uh, Near East countries on uh, food banks. If you go and see the Egyptian food bank, Jordanian food bank, etc., they're very much looking at how 
to reallocate the waste that we all know in this society is there is so much food given out in meals and therefore there is so much food thrown away afterwards and there is now quite a lot of connection of reusing that food to feed uh, local populations that do not have access to that food so there's a um, waste prevention but also uh, a social dimension which i think we should look at and the third point was uh, there is quite a lot of attention now that is being given to uh, eco um, economic and social so social and solidarity economy and a lot of it in, in, is in urban areas with women's group so i think there again it contributes to the food environment and I think these are specific aspects that could be useful in this part of the world. Thank you. If, uh, may I insert? And may I insert? Uh, in reference to what uh, you, Gianluca, just said, the building territorial food system or sustainable diet, I would really like to read the number three, like number one and number two, they can really uh, merge together. I have a problem with uh, number uh, three in reference to just what you said, the building territorial food system of sustainable diet. And, and we know very well, we started in 2010 together. In this case, in, in, in number three, you build, uh, it's written, building a food environment that support healthy, healthy eating practice. And then, then later, lack of access to healthy food. I have really some concern in the use of the word in healthy food, healthy eating practice in the context of a building territorial food system on sustainable diet. Can you uh, also with Alexander clarify, maybe it is possible to recast the main funding number three to fit, I believe, more appropriate in the territorial food system ground on sustainable diet. Thanks. Uh, Alexander, do you want uh, to tell something? Or I'm, I'm not sure I've totally understood the point made 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 by by Sandro. Uh, I I understand and agree that speaking about healthy foods instead of healthy diets is, is not the ideal. However, uh, there was very clearly during that session the mention of healthy foods, for instance, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits. And one of the questions, which is particularly important, is how to provide easy access to these kinds of foods so that people can buy them at the moment when they can do their shopping, not shop once every week or once every month as is happening in some countries so there is the the mention of healthy foods in that context um, maybe it would be better if we precise what we mean by healthy foods and say fresh vegetables and fruits for instance or or fresh fish um, and as i have the, the floor just to, just to insist on how relevant I think is the, the topic selected by, by John Luca of building territorial food systems. Because of what I have felt in general in Palermo, as compared to some other events, which was really a very strong interest of some new categories of actors in our discussions about uh, sustainable diets and the Mediterranean diets, mainly local public authorities, uh, some civil society actors, and also some very important economic actors, uh, hostelry, restaurants, local value chains, actors of local food systems, and uh, 
for me, one of the issues is, is how to give the opportunity to all of these actors to work together around a, a sense of common identity, common purpose, for various reasons linked to the territory, which are both economic, social, health, uh, sociality to a certain extent with social values, and also culture, because this is generally what everything is grounded on when we speak about a local identity. So this made, for me, this was really uh, around that, that, that there might be new opportunities, interest of, of new categories of actors in, in this common discourse. And to hear, we need to hear what they want, what, what they can do, and, and find ways to facilitate uh, kind of collective actions of very different categories of people with very different interests. Thank you very much, Alessandra. I see that we have a Francesca Forno of the University of Trento who is organizing a conference of food systems in Trento next uh, November. Uh, Francesco, can uh, you tell us uh, hi and maybe uh, let us know a little bit what you are doing? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we do. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, I'm a sociologist here in Trento. I'm a professor of sociology, expert in cognitive action dynamics. And uh, we have built a um, food policy council. We have been working for two years around uh, building trust among different actors in the, more or less in the same line you were discussing just, just now. And uh, now within the, the table that is made by different stakeholders, uh, solidarity purchasing group, um, participants, uh, farmers, young farmers, uh, member of the Bio Distretto, that is uh, a district, uh, uh, I mean, a, a network of young farmers that are producing uh, organic food. And uh, within this work that has been long for two years, that has been going on for two years, we have decided to build a conference around uh, to three main issues, production, distribution, and consumption. Things are going very well. There is uh, there is a lot of interest around this, and uh, one of the topic um, addressed in the conference is exactly what we were discussing. Although I joined just five minutes ago, but I could catch some words. That is a concept of sustainable diet, and the idea is more or less uh, discussing um, together with all these different actors what this concept really means. We we have we know that means buying more local food but Trento is also a very peculiar area because it's a mountain area so there is not uh, is also very specialized um, in, in few products so um, I mean <coughs> this is just a few words about what we are trying to do mm -hmm. and happy for inviting me here because uh, uh, what I could already catch in just five minutes was very relevant for what I'm trying to do. And thank you very much, Francesca. I, can I just react very quickly to what Francesca just said? She, she, I, I'm completely supportive and I'm, I am involved with that exercise in Trento and thank you very much, Francesca. But I think it is very important also when we're talking of Mediterranean uh, food systems, I believe that Trento is much more of an alpine food system. And I think that it, I, I believe there may be other Italian cities. There's a lot of other Italian cities uh, that may not have gone to the level Trento is doing about getting the food council. So, so the point is very well taken. There's a lot of cities that have things to bring up to that discussion. And I certainly hope we'll have a similar discussion one day on alpine food systems with people in Europe, in Switzerland, in Austria, etc. And probably Pyrenees and the Carpathian also. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I just say something on what we were discussing from before? I'm trying to come up with a reduced version of this list from what I'm trying to, from what I understood. Is that okay? 
Yes. Uh, okay. Hmm. All right. So, um, uh, with respect to what you brought forward, so the importance of territorial uh, food systems, which was also brought up, so short supply chains, let's say, um, I think that's very important. But I think if we consider the con if we come from a say healthy diets perspective, let me just stay on healthy diets now without going into the sustainable aspect. One of the biggest problems in the Mediterranean is a rise in overweight and obesity. And that has two sides of the coin. So people are not eating enough fresh fruits and vegetables and legumes. We know what people are not eating enough of. But they're also overeating highly processed foods, carbohydrates, and sugars and fats. So we know this. So working on territorial short supply chains would probably help with the healthy foods, what we're here referring to as healthy foods, which we can qualify, I think, when we, when we discuss how we, how we move forward. But the other side of the equation also needs to be considered. So if the work packages, I don't know exactly what this is leading to, but if it will be leading to further research and data collection, it would be important to understand the exposure that people have to these unhealthy foods. So which types of retail outlets, what's the relative price of these types of foods, because there isn't really this type of information in the Mediterranean. Even if I think of Italy itself, we don't really have um, this type of information. So it, it could be worth looking into it. I know it didn't come up actually in the session, unless maybe it's on the point uh, number 0.5 or, well, it's not really food deserts, I can't say. I think we're more in the situation of food swamps in the, in the Mediterranean. But I thought that eating out would have been also an important aspect because I think about at least 25 or 30 percent of what people spend in terms of food, then it depends on the quintile, goes on eating out. It's an important sector. Of course, street vendors are important, but we're also seeing the, the, the increasing penetration of certain types of eat outlets, eating out outlets, where there is a strong supply of foods that are high in salts, fats, and sugars. So understanding what I'm saying is understanding the supply of the unhealthy foods would also be, I think, an important work to carry out in the future. Yes, Dalia, go ahead. Thank you, Dalia. I think, uh, yes, this is uh, very relevant. May I try to sum up uh, uh, shortly what has been said so far? Um, I think that uh, the issue of building territorial food system links very much to uh, building um, uh, food environments, uh, considering that if, like in the point one or in point two, uh, putting emphasis on people, we could start on uh, what are the, the freedoms of choice of people in a given context. Uh, so in a given city, in a given neighborhood, etc. It's not just about space, that is, uh, uh, it is uh, correctly claimed in uh, point two, but it's a problem of a social and symbolic environment. On this regard, we can uh, consider different and nested uh, food environments. The first food environment uh, is uh, uh, for example, in the neighborhood, the, the retailing or the, let's say, the outlets that can provide the food to which it's possible to have access. But then there is an economic aspect related to relative prices. And then there is, for example, if you get into retailers, there is a, a, a food environment within the retailer itself because the way you display food in the shop uh, brings consumers to make uh, the given choices rather than other choice. So having a systemic approach on all of this means trying to figure out at a, a urban level or a territorial level what is available in a given uh, community what can be sourced from the outside and what is the balance between local production and outside production. And this is something related to 
to the policy level, to the governance level. And on this regard, I think that uh, uh, food movements, uh, but uh, more in general, uh, public-private partnership are very relevant. And uh, to this extent, I think that uh, what uh, Trento is doing and what other cities are doing in, in Italy or in Mediterranean areas can be uh, very relevant to this because uh, uh, we need to find uh, a methodology to assess what uh, uh, and analyze what is the environment for uh, consumers and uh, what is uh, influencing uh, behavior. On this regard, I think that uh, the issue of eating out, eating out is uh, very important because it, it, if we consider it, it in terms of uh, a symbolic input, so to the uh, capacity to influence consumers' behavior, I think that uh, eating out uh, has a very big importance. So on this regard, uh, uh, this should be one of the aspects to be involved into a, a strategy for urban food environments. But I don't want to make it too long. I would like to, to, yes, to, to raise uh, Comments from others. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Hi. Um, and thank you. I, I would like to to give back to you some of the lesson learned during the last American University conference in Rome. Um, it was it, it, actually it was called uh, sustainable diet uh, and sustainable food system. It was very very interesting for me to be one of the uh, the rapporteur of the, of the my session that was called um, spaces sustainable spaces and scaling. Actually, uh, we talked a lot about what it, what are food environment and how food environment impact on uh, human diets. Um, and actually, I, I would like to stress some points that came out out of the, the conversation and the, um, uh, from the conveners. Uh, we talk uh, a lot about how uh, public and private spaces uh, influence dietary pattern, patterns and vice versa. Uh, so th th there is a, um, a seminal book by uh, Caroline Steele that is called Hungry City that uh, clearly states how spaces influence diets and it's very very important for uh, in this in this situation and in the Mediterranean uh, countries is uh, very very relevant. And also we talk about the, um, the attractiveness of rural areas, so the, uh, the born of the so-called the new rural dwellers of, or of the Talibans of food, this nice uh, expression that to express the new, uh, new patterns, but also new symbolic, new cognitive relationships between food and uh, dietary uh, habits. Um, also, we talk about uh, migrants, uh, migrants by force, by choice, uh, but also by necessity that now they live in our countries and they actually, they run most of uh, our, for example, uh, zootechnical activities. Um, we also talk about uh, dichotomies and also linkages between uh, words as uh, urban and rural, between mountains and lowlands, between marginal and urbanized areas, and also uh, the role of uh, urban agriculture and the urban gardening in shaping our diet. Actually, uh, in, in my studies and also in my, in my experience, I, I have seen a lot of many cases of urban farming and urban gardening. And I think that uh, apart from the productive role that can they have, they play a very, very important role in uh, make people more aware about where food comes from and how food is produced and how uh, young people can, uh, can improve and can learn uh, about 
specificities of food and etc and you, uh, we know that uh, we uh, all we as we we know very well these issues but i think it's very very important to stress the role of urban agriculture both as productive role and both and uh, as a social and um, formative role uh, so this is my my contributor i i would have i i wanted to light and light the, the role of food environments and how food environments can can shape our diets. So thank you for involving me. Hey, can, I, uh, any can, I follow, can I follow on what John yes. Piero just said? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was just, uh, I was actually starting to count, but there's probably something like 30 or 40 cities in the Mediterranean area that has signed the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. And there has been, now it's been going on for five years, and there's a considerable effort that has been done to document the practices these different cities had. And as you might remember, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact was all about getting mayors to promote sustainable urban food systems. So if you, there have been already a couple of publications, was once, funded by Barilla in this year. There was a publication with FAO, RUAF, et cetera. There's a lot of experience there. And what we are doing, I think it would be quite useful to contact those different cities and actually have a kind of looking at what are the things they're doing in Mediterranean cities in order to elicit those different dimensions that we could be using uh, for sustainable food system in that area. Yes, I think that, that this is a very important uh, uh, aspect for action because we are asked uh, here in this conversation to identify some points for action. And I think this is very important because uh, uh, our session in Palermo was very good in my view in identifying the problem. Uh, maybe the issues of policies were not considered much because uh, maybe it was not the the case in that uh, in uh, in that workshop. But I think that a way to turn this concept of uh, a food environment into policies is really to look at the urban dimension of policies and try to see uh, how this uh, urban dimension may affect uh, dietary change. Um, and uh, I, I think that, uh, yes, uh, contacting the cities that are doing this work uh, and uh, sometimes without any resource because uh, we have to consider that uh, we have uh, uh, agricultural policies in Europe, but we don't have food policies with any support. So uh, what the, the cities are doing is just to try to raise funds in order to carry out projects, but uh, sometimes they don't have staff, they don't have uh, uh, any money to, to run uh, support schemes. Um, uh, what I don't see in these points uh, is the role of a public procurement, uh, which normally in the, uh, the issues on food environment, uh, it's uh, considered very important. So I may suggest to consider it as well uh, as uh, one important aspect of uh, food strategies and uh, to, to building uh, healthy food environments. Yes, Sandro. Yes. By taking as experience the first web uh, uh, dialogue that we did, uh, the risk is that we speak a very vague, sorry, open way, and it's very difficult then uh, to uh, reinforce the main funding that were already identified uh, uh, by opening a new discussion. Then uh, uh, also uh, was difficult at uh, the, uh, the web uh, of the last week uh, to close uh, at the end anything. 
by the moment that also you are leaving uh, shortly, uh, Gianluca, I really will kind of to uh, raise the attention about what uh, was the main funding that you wrote with Alexander in order to understand how this um, are coherent with the discussion. Like, for example, I go back with what maybe I was not able to, uh, to, uh, to say properly. If you speak about the building territorial food system, I go to look for in the text if I find this concept, as well as the concept of sustainable diet as a wording in the text, and I don't find. If now I find, for example, procurement, like you said, I don't find. So I really would like maybe to suggest to have a dialogue but then uh, you and uh, Alexander try to uh, revise the main point, main, main point, main finding. And like uh, for the others, we try uh, to reduce it to maximum to five main point, uh, because we have really to try uh, to have a grid uh, that is possible then uh, in some way to associate. Uh, if not, the risk is that we open now a discussion on urban and rural that is already part in the wording of the session that was run by Jorge Fonseca, session number three, specifically on the urban food policy pact and rural and urban interlinkage. You know what I'm, what I'm proposing is really like a, to try to give a, a, some kind of fil rouge in what we are discussing, because if not, I believe that it would be very difficult to have some concrete outcome from this conversation, like it was exactly last week. Can I, I, I have very concrete things to suggest. Yes, let's reply in. First of all. Sandro. I, would, um, I, I understand your concern, but I'm not. I, I don't think we are going away from trying to find more concrete and I would say catalytic uh, points on which to insist. For instance, the importance of, of public procurement is both linked to, to this question of uh, territorial food system and also to the question of eating out, because a lot of the eating out is in fact either in public places like schools and hospitals or in places that through public-private partnerships can be part of, of a territorial policy of, of a public view of, of how things can be improved. And as we are in this question of, of reducing the numbers, if we can come back to, to the list of them, because I think part of the items that were there were in fact research results that would be part of the background. Mm -hmm. Item six, uh, seven, and if I remember well, eight are really examples uh, that that can be, to a certain extent, part of a background after which we would go rather to actions. And one, two, and three are very linked and, and could be one. So we can probably reduce it. We can see the num how, how many items you really want to get out of it, considering that there are also other parallel discussions. But we can probably arrive to two or three big items that I personally would, would also link to the actors that are the most concerned, so probably something around public policies and local public authorities, probably also something around retailing when we think about food environment, and, 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 and finally maybe an item about eating out, something like that. So I think there are already two or three big axes around which can coalesce the, the various comments that have been made un until now. Yes, Florence had uh, 
Yes, I'd like to, to react to two points you made, Gianluca. The first thing, as you know, there is now um, a CEMAS, which is uh, the Centro Mundial de Valencia para Alimentación Urbana Sostenible, which is supported by FAO. I think CEMAS could perhaps be in a good position to help draw the experiences of cities around uh, the Mediterranean, the work you have done, Gianluca, uh, in Italian cities is well taken into account. There's a lot of work that's happened in France and Spain, but also in other countries. And I think we could very concretely approach SEMAS and the cities that have signed to say who is interested in documenting what they've done. And there's already the example that was done this year for other cities. So the format is there and it would be fairly feasible. The second point was the one on public procurement. You will be interested to know that on 31st of October, that is this Thursday, there is going to be a meeting held in FAO with the people in FAO, but also WHO, UNEP, um, and whoever else there. They're all going to start pulling what they've already done in public procurement because they do see this as an absolutely key dimension. So I think here again, it's not an idea that's floating in the air. This was very much as a follow-up to the meeting in Montpellier that was three weeks ago, and that was the annual meetings of the mayors of the Milan Pact. So I think these two things are extremely concrete and would fit in very nicely in the follow-up of the Palermo meeting. Can I add something along those lines? Sorry, just to this is very late. And what you were saying on, you know, there are cities who have, ex I mean, who have intervened in terms of food environment. And I don't know about the center in Valencia, but I'm sure that uh, the World Cancer Research Fund, it has a big, if you go into the website, there's a big uh, Excel sheet and there's a big repository of food environment policies. So what countries have concretely done under the various components of the food environment to make it healthier? For example, I mean, most of them have been carried out in rich countries, in high income countries in the United States, in Australia, in Northern Europe. So I think, I'm not, again, I don't know exactly what you're planning to do with, with all of this, but if it has to be part of your background, let's say, um, work, it would be worth looking at at least also because some of these interventions have also been evaluated by universities. They've been evaluated positively. So they could be good food for thought for some cities. Um, I know that GAIN has, um, let's say, taken the cue from what the Nourishing uh, Group has done and has just come up with a publication which it has presented in the Montpellier conference called something like... This, is, this is the menu. document I was referring to. Okay, menu, Montpellier menu, for, city, menu for local governments on what they can do for food environments. So I think if you take that publication plus the nourishing website um, information, that would give you a pretty good idea of what cities have done around the world to increase the consumption of healthy foods, if you want to stay on this uh, controversial dichotomy, and to make it, less, make it less easy or less appealing to consume the foods that are high in fat, salt, and sugar, the ultra-processed foods. So just, just, to, um, just to let you know that this has been going on. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dalia. Uh, I think that... Um, Yes, to, to, to meet the expectation of Sandro about giving uh, some uh, key issues and uh, synthesizing, uh, I very much support what Alessandro was saying, that uh, we have uh, uh, discussed about uh, several things that uh, uh, converge in the same point. In order to build uh, the sustainable food systems and sustainable territorial food system, we have to look at uh, how people make choices. And, uh, and on this regard, uh, our action and our posi positioning in the, let's say, the landscape of uh, urban movements, uh, urban strategies, etc., 
is to remark the importance of the food environment, not only as a spatial uh, dimension, but in its social and uh, a symbolic dimension. So in my view, a first point, uh, recognition of food as a multidimensional issue is uh, still the first point. The second uh, is uh, very much important because uh, it is about people. So we have to put people at the center of our uh, 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 analysis of the food environment. Maybe the third point can be uh, the, um, let's say, the gateway to uh, speaking about food systems because food system and sustainable diets are in the title. So uh, to, to a certain extent, uh, we discussed about them at length. But uh, in this case, we have to link uh, what can a territorial food system do in terms of improving uh, uh, food environments for people, considering the uh, several dimensions. And on this regard, I think that uh, the point number uh, number uh, seven. No, sorry. Uh, yes, the point number five. It's very important. Material determinants, competencies, and meaning. So, uh, strategies for a food system should address these three points, and policies should address these three points. And this is a contribution we can give also to cities uh, in Valencia and the center of Valencia. I agree very much with this, but also all the other movements that are raising in, in Europe and in other countries to try to address these points and see how uh, the organization of the, the, the food system can really uh, influence uh, consumers' behavior. Um, I'm sorry that uh, uh, in, in five minutes' time I will have to leave, so maybe I will uh, give uh, the, the stick to Alexander to, to carry on with the, the, the process, okay? Okay, thank you, um, yeah. and, and I hope Andrew will help me to carry the stick uh, to the end, and especially, and I think we're already in that movement, we, we are trying really to get out what are the leading principles, not only around food environment in itself, but about food environment as a key element of the whole strategy of constructing a way forward uh, after Palermo towards more concrete actions and, and results. Am I right, Sandro? That's the purpose? Yes. Uh, and then we have also to try to see to create uh, and, and next time with the urban the session urban and the session culture because they are very close but uh, today it was not possible to have uh, to associate the other so this we are trying to understand the format but this is what you said you know it's very limited for the participant that they are participating today maybe what i would suggest is, is that if we can get out of this session two or three leading principles to bring them to the next one because it's very linked to urban environment and, and culture. And I think the points that Jean-Luc had just made about the three dimensions that need to be taken into account in public policies could be part of the principles that would, would also help liars with the next session. Uh, then I just want to raise a point and here, Sandro, you'll be furious because it opens a new question. We also have to be careful 
not to exclude rural areas from our thinking. Uh, because the question of food environment is also a question in rural areas, and, and there are now, as has been shown in the Transmango project, rural areas that are food. So there are questions of urban areas, of rural urban, and also questions about rural areas in, in themselves that we should not forget. And, and also, I'm insisting on that because maybe one of the questions that is so important in the Mediterranean as a whole is precisely the relations with the, the areas which are the most urbanized around the Mediterranean and rural areas that may be a bit less developed and, and further from the coast and the link between these two types of areas. And so, where would we go from here if we agree on what has been summarized as the main principles out of this session? So I'll go on. And, and maybe also, apart from the principles that have been highlighted, there are also some key actions. One of them is, is the idea to link with uh, networks and institutions at uh, city level. Another one that was suggested by Florence in the beginning was to see how to maybe link better with some civil society, social movements. A third one could be how to extract information from research networks. And, I, and there I have a question, to what extent what has been found in the United States or Canada or Australia could be extended to the Mediterranean? Mm. Is it something that might happen in the future or are there still big differences between the two types of areas. So these are definitely research questions and probably research action questions. I think, uh, can I? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I think that um, also according to some recent studies, um, in urban areas there is go ongoing a, a sort of westernization of diets that it means that it, they are going uh, more and more near to uh, patterns that are similar to U.S. Uh, diets or Canada, Canada Canadian diets uh, or Anglo-Saxon uh, countries. Uh, maybe uh, in the rural areas it's much more difficult to understand patterns because uh, the, um, actually people are more spread in their territory, it's so, so it's much more difficult to understand and also to gain data, to reach data, to uh, to have some uh, monitoring of what are the diets in the rural areas, while in the urban areas it's much more simple because of it's it's a matter of density. This being said, I, I think everybody agrees that this is something that's happening all over the world, westernization of, of diets. But there are still at, at questions about how it, how it happens exactly in various contexts. What are the exact drivers of it? And mm -hmm. one of the questions I, I was thinking of when we have these discussions on two different uh, issues, one is not enough access to healthy food, and another one was too easy access to unhealthy food. One of the, the questions that, that for me still needs to be solved is, are there competition between the two, or are there different kinds of drivers at play? 
not to use more healthy foods or to use more unhealthy. In other words, are they competing between themselves or do they have common drivers, these two issues? Or are there separate kinds of drivers, for instance, uh, loss of time, not enough time to cook and, and issues of, of that kind? And there might be value in, in trying to understand more of these because these are at the interface between food environment, capacities, behavior, and probably acting differently in urban and in rural areas and in the middle in small cities because we tend to think that urban is a kind of homogeneous thing or we talk about it like that but there are very big differences between big cities and small cities center of cities and and suburban areas so we we probably need to be careful in the way we talk about these kind of phenomenons not to oversimplify Things that in reality are probably quite complex. Yeah, awesome. Yes, I think this is a very important point. And uh, as you know, there's been that process that has been started by UN Habitat on Urban Rural Linkages. Now, the and we did mention last time the guiding principles. Now there are uh, articles coming up. There is an SCN. Uh, paper that's going to look at nutrition and urban rural linkages and looking precisely that there's also a, not a chapter in the book that bioversity is putting together which is looking at the relevance of urban rural linkages and biodiversity so this topic is now uh, getting quite a lot of attention and I'd be happy to share whatever of those documents are already published or drafts if they're not completely advanced. So I think it's, it's a very important issue. But, it, but it's not a new issue, that's said. There are now, what is really interesting is our conversation is really coming at the crossroads at a whole series of processes that several of us are involved in on different angles and the, the challenge in, is indeed going to come with that common position. <clears throat> May I? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> There's another point that should, I believe, uh, stress the more. The network of the networks, the, the critical mass uh, converging at some point, that is one of the main uh, parts on which we are reflecting. We are not uh, really creating something new or inventing the wheel. We are trying uh, really to by taking the, the stop taking of the reality and the, to connect what should be connected. Just what was said is another point that in the main fund, I'm really concerned on the, uh, on the wording. In, uh, in what uh, this uh, web dialogue number two will produce in wording, in text. If it will be possible, like, uh, to, uh, to associate the procurement uh, and the meaning of eating out. Then uh, to precise uh, what means uh, healthy, healthy food, that is a really a controversial story, politically speaking, with a lot of country against that, that we have also to reflect on that issue that is very sensitive. And what just Florence, uh, uh, reset for the, the, again that, that there are many many converging network that exist. So if it's possible to highlight this converging, uh, um, I call uh, network, the network of the network. But in the text, it will be very important that there is some kind. Uh, uh, some kind of result that we can share with the section on urban and the rural and the section of on food culture in order to give it to them something. I don't believe at this point uh, that we are able, uh, if you want, but I don't think that it's too much feasible to, to pass through the main, uh, the output from the last week uh, uh, web dialogue because I think that we should maybe put a more uh, collaborative uh, time now to try to understand this uh, 
uh, Ming Fangi from your session, Alexander. I don't know what you think of because uh, Gianluca already left. Uh, Sa Sandro, we, we still have 45 minutes, which is at the same time not a lot of time, but also a lot of time. Okay. If you consider that the priority is to finalize the wording of the main outputs from this session, if somebody can have access on the screen and modify on the screen, we can do it immediately. No, 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 no. You no, no, because so you, are insisting on, you are insisting on it. Huh? Uh, can I? Another option can be to consider the other package of recommendations of the first dialogue and see how they can relate. And a third option would be to go to any other important point, as maybe Dalia is going to raise one. <laughs> <laughs> No, I just wanted to make two points. One is this issue of the wording, because it's true. It is in FAO quite controversial, and some countries don't like it. If you read the literature on you know, scientific papers, they use it. I think the latest Eat Lancet used healthy foods, unhealthy foods. OK, considering though that it's controversial, we can opt for nutritious and less nutritious food, because that's acceptable. So, uh, but I wouldn't get rid of the concept, let's say, because realistically, and that's what the food environment literature has been saying for decades, people are disproportionately exposed to certain types of foods because they're also heavily marketed. So even if you wanted to eat less of them and therefore have a healthy diet, it's a bit hard to do so. So in order to target these types of uh, places and foods, you need to also uh, conceptually make a distinction. Anyway, that's just to, so that was, that was the first point. You could also say nutritious foods and then refer to the dietary patterns of the population because what I'm saying is that we know that people are not eating enough fresh fruits and vegetables and legumes, so you could use them as a proxy, let's say. But anyway, let, let, that's maybe getting into the details. Another thing is that food culture and what you were saying about uh, the fact that the, in the United States, in Australia, in Northern Europe, where many of these studies have been carried out, they have come to some conclusions that they may not be the same in the Mediterranean area. Yes, I agree fully, which is why, and I mean, we're also speaking of the drivers. Why is it that people are eating more of certain types of foods and less of others? Are they the same drivers? And this is exactly why the concept of food environment came up, because it wasn't just sufficient to educate people, but you also needed to, then there are structural issues that we need to be looking at, such as relative price and, and availability. So there is a bit of a consensus on the drivers, the fact that you, know, you are overexposed to certain types of foods, the relative prices have changed, but it's also true that the retail environment, for example, in the south of Europe and the north of the, of the Mediterranean, is not the same as what we find in the United States and Northern Europe and Australia. So, it, for example, it presents certain aspects such as traditional food outlets that sell the fresh foods that can help, that kind of don't really exist in the United States or they've been reintroduced with farmers markets. So, what I mean to say, just to cut it short, is that we would need to collect the qualitative data on why people uh, eat in a certain way. So it's important to have information, quantitative information on their dietary patterns, but we also need to collect qualitative information on reasons for choosing certain ways of eating and others. So again, if this, what we're talking about is to be transformed into work packages and working areas, this would be an area of further inquiry because every country will have its specificity, of course. If I may, I think that there were two very different and very important points in that. The, the, the first point for me is this question of wording. Huh? I, I, you're totally right. Most of the literature says healthy food, unhealthy foods. Uh, we may want either, there are two ways to replace that. Either you replace by nutrition, dense foods, or less. So that's one option. Another option would be to select some groups of um, foods 
that are more represented in the Mediterranean diet than in other diets, like vegetables and fruits. As an example, because the retailing of vegetables and fruits is very specific, especially in the Mediterranean, or at least in Italy. Uh, and on the other hand, talk about more fat and, and sugar dense products and foods and beverages. So that could be an option. And I think it would make more sense to have groups of foods because they are at a certain place in the pyramid. And, and it speaks to people and you can find more concrete action than nutrition, dense foods, which frankly doesn't speak to anybody, apart from a, a restricted group of people that immediately, unconsciously translate them in healthy, unhealthy. So that was one thing. The, the, the second thing which is important is, I think, is we're trying to identify very concrete pathways on which both to work, but also possibly already begin changing things. So if we identify retailing as an important issue, and I think it is the case, it would be worthwhile to have it clearly identified, having the words in the outcomes of that session. And while you were speaking about food culture, I was also thinking that one of the main differences, probably, between uh, Anglo-Saxon culture, and especially the United States, and the Mediterranean, is uh, that in the Mediterranean, meals still exist and are still a kind of collective experience. One of the questions for me is, it's clearly very cultural, would you include that as part of the food environment as the individual experience with food or would you restrict the food environment to more place-based and or broadly uh, interactions between an individual and the society as a whole like through advertising for instance because i think the, these questions of how the meals are taken, with whom, for how long, uh, is also an important part of the question. For, for instance, for how much time do you stop at lunch? Do you still have a lunch or not? This is something very specific. I think. Oh, he's muted. You're muted. Okay, mute. <laughs> Go ahead, Florence. Yes, um, talking of the things that were done in related field of activities in, uh, in the last two years, something like that, uh, and that are related to the Mediterranean the region, there was um, a working group in the Committee on World Food Security on Urbanization and Rural Transformation. And there was a side event in particular, and, and Luke, uh, Gianluca Brunovi was on the podium with me. So he's gone, but it's an event he was at. And at that event, there was a lady called Swad Mahmoud who talked, and she's from Tunis, and she was looking at gender issues related to that. So I think there again, we can retrieve some work that has already been done and try and, it's, and bring all these things together and what we're doing. Okay, good. Uh, and, and one other point that was highlighted by Sanvo and Yen to one of the questions of this issue of networks and, and networks, and how do we retrieve what has been already done in such a way that it's immediately usable? Um, what kind of format? What, is, what, is, what, what would be the best way to do it? Uh, and also in order to be sure that it can be both upscaled and outscaled because context is very important 
and the way you you take out of their context experiences to bring them in another context requires either adaptation or to have people explaining really why it has worked and not worked with all the details of the initial context. Any other further comment on that? Can I, sorry, I don't want to. Go ahead, go ahead. I just have one, because I was looking at Jose and Divine, and they're working for an area of work here in FAO where the way food is transformed from farm gate plates is very important. So what this brings to my mind is the issue of time, because one of the problems uh, that, there, that we have today, and one of the reasons why convenience food and eating out is so important is that people don't have time. And linking back to what you were saying about which actors to involve when we discuss this at city level, or small cities, rural uh, areas too, because uh, the issue is relevant there too, even in rural areas people don't have time, um, is how, how can the small industry, the small and medium industry, be involved in such a way that they can supply food that is um, transformed in such a way that it's easily consumed without being high in fat, salt and sugar. That's really a key issue. Because, and we haven't really discussed it, we haven't really discussed it with food technologists to know whether it's feasible, whether it's, it can be affordable, but at the same time bring profits to the, to the businesses. That whole issue there is a bit of a, of a gray, of a gray area. And so since we'll be work, might be working on the eating out and how to make certain foods available in a certain way, we could also be looking at issues of of processing and starting a dialogue with, with private sector on this. I mean, I, I, there are virtuous examples. It's not that people need to be poked into doing this. So there are big, medium and small industries that have started doing this and in, in such a way that it's profitable and also cheap for the consumer. So it would be nice uh, to collect information on this and maybe use it as case studies to spark it's not an extra point. It's part of eating out. Well, that was my fear, introducing extra issues that oh, okay. were not discussed here. Sorry. That's why I, I, you didn't didn't bring it up. Okay, all right. I wasn't in Palermo. I don't know, you know to what degree we need to diverge. So I think okay. it's good for us to, to listen and then position ourselves where we can be of most value to the process. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. kind of how we're saying this. Okay, I think it would be a spin off yeah. of the eating out because a lot, a lot of times the eating out is for convenience because people don't have time. So that's why it would be part of, but you know, I've said it, just take it, you're the people leading this process. So. If already we start leading everything that's yeah. already been done, it's going to be made. May I, Alexander? Yeah. yeah. Okay, the, the, title, the title today is Making Progress in Better Understanding Food Environment for the Design of a Sustainable Food System Conceptual Framework. Okay. If we watch now, going back to, quest, to the main point uh, three, the main point three, that the point one and two is perfect to use the food environment uh, Concept, but when we go to point three, build a food environment that support the healthy eating practice. I would like maybe a building a food environment that supports a sustainable food system. We have a really to tell and understand how the food environment concept notion that is like I story that we come and face in that moment, people move in some way. Number three building a food environment that support a sustainable food system, not that, that just go immediately to the healthy eating practice and healthy food and then come. Then if you see point eight, because then it comes to the problem of uh, number three, stay for a moment, number three, that at the end they confront inequalities. We know very well what it means inequality. They are not the access, a lot of people, they don't have access, the economic finance to buy fresh food, fruit, vegetables, like that. If you go to number eight, you will see that there it is more specified uh, 
to buy in shorter food supply chain toward an increase of fresh fruit and vegetable reduction of the meat, then they go to consumption. But I would like you really to better understand, eh, like we are supposed to do, how food environment supports the sustainable food system. And then they come require change of surrounding condition. As we know, the sustainable diet approach brings not just only the health dimension, but the economic dimension, the biodiversity dimension together with the environmental dimension, the social cultural dimension. So it's a kind of approach that I believe the food environment should highlight link the two sustainable food system, not the, to the one aspect that is the consumption aspect. But that I believe in this main point, uh, it's very difficult to say that we are increasing, making progress in better understanding the food environment. From this, uh, when you are going uh, with Jean-Luc, take into account our discussion to recast uh, this main fu funding. We should increase a, a, a better understanding of what is a food uh, environment, especially because if there is a food desert that is illustrative, what it means is a terminology that should be articulated in the context of a food system and the sustainability of the food system by link consumption production. Here I think that in some way I lost myself, say, in in recasting uh, what uh, it is about, uh, the sequence of uh, the, this point, like uh, the identification, uh, re we needed to go behind the, the rational choice uh, theory. Perfect. And then uh, I believe that uh, we could uh, connect uh, this point in order to make a progress in uh, food environment understanding. Sandra. Yeah. Sandro, first thing, remember that these were the conclusions of the session. They were meant as the conclusion of this session, not as broad principles to orient action in the future, which is why some of them are summaries of research that was presented. It is the case for the French experience, and it is the case for the experience in Tunisia. It's yeah. not all conceptual and principle. So some of them, as I said at one stage, should be either taken out or put as part of the background because they are not principles. They are evidence-based in a certain context, at a certain moment. Um, and, and, and I take this opportunity to answer your question of the beginning about the evidence behind the French figures. It is the conclusion of years of research in INRA on these particular issues. Yep. Sorry, I think... <laughs> I lost you at one stage. Um, then you, you, you were talking about the, the fact that food environment, we seem to be very focused on consumption and forgetting the rest of the food system. But if this is very linked to our entry point, the food environment is the interface between the consumer and the rest of the food system. So our entry point is precisely this relation. The rest of the food system can be related to it, but as it regards influence this interaction. But this can also go both, both ways because it is true that the consumer also has an impact through his choices, practices on, on the whole food system. And, and maybe coming back, because I think it could give us a very good example of how we can figure it out on what Dalia said about this question of time, because this is probably one of the most important drivers of changes in, in of our food culture, uh, the change in our use of time. And it's probably also still one of the biggest differences between the Mediterranean and for instance, the United Kingdom, where very extensive study has shown that average time 
to prepare the meal of a whole five-person family is eight minutes. <laughs> so, uh, this question of how you manage time is a very important one. There are two options. Either you have convenience food and something that you just put in the microwave, or you go eating out. And this question of eating out can be, it includes going out to buy red, ready food and taking it back home. It, it now covers in some countries 75% of the meals. So it has a huge role to play in the way diets are going to evolve. And it may be easier to have healthy meals eating out than healthy meals prepared by the industry to be stored for two months before being used, including for industrial processes reasons, and also because of the way people interact with it. And one thing that is sure, by definition, I would say, eating out probably provides more jobs per calorie and so it's more sustainable in that perspective and also probably more social contact. So it, it's really, it, it may be a very central question. And, and even further, I am wondering if the question of food desert shouldn't be also reconsidered with this angle of eating out. I mean, not only where you find food, but where you can easily find healthy street food at, a, at an accessible price and culturally accessible. And this may be also still one of the characteristics of many Mediterranean countries or areas, also in, in some areas in, in Asia. So, and, and it has to do also with urban policies. It is also linked to tourism. It is also linked to migration. So there are plenty of issues around it, even if, as Sandro, very rightly recalled, it cannot be totally taken out of the whole food system as a whole. But it can be a, a very interesting entry point. Do you spare time by industrializing or by developing small scale eating out, small scale industries and, and, and speaking about the thing, ju just one more point about the question of, of uh, ready-made foods and particularly the fourth and fifth generation of salads and vegetables, which is now being extremely questioned because it uses a lot of plastic. Mm -hmm. So there might, at one stage, there will be trade-offs between food losses and waste, use of plastic, ready-made foods, and in many cases, eating out, or having readily available products in the street might be a better way to manage these trade-offs because they substitute labor to plastic to a certain extent. But of course, it, it, it has also a cost. But it has a cost that brings income to other categories of people. And we must not forget that all over the world, people working in the food industry as a whole, from farmers to retailing and distribution, are the less paid. So giving more money for your food is also a way to give more money to some of the poorest categories of the population. And from a sustainability perspective, it does make sense. I'll stop here. And migrants to what you're saying, Alexandre, because that's where you have the, I, I live near Piazza Vittorio, all the people that are serving food, they're all from Bangladesh. Yes. So I think it's, and it's a key way of inserting migrants 
and diversifying diets. Yeah, totally agree. So, Sandro, do do you think we 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 need to make more progress? And or do you think that we can make more progress on these points now? Uh, I believe that we are trying to understand the format of this web dialogue because uh, um, by thematic section they don't work, uh, I, be, I feel, uh, too well in the sense that this should be intersectional session but uh, technically uh, difficult to combine several sections and to have some kind of outcome. But I believe that for like what we have done today, we have made a progress in this kind of exchange. But the point is to, like you said, the, the, I have realized that the main funding from Palermo were main funding from sessions. Yes. They are now trying to use the main funding from session as a, a principle to be used in design a conceptual framework. That is an exercise a little bit uh, 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 still harder to be understood because yeah. we are working uh, like you come uh, in the track change we advanced uh, a lot, you know? But this ability that if it was possible to have other participants from the other session, we could manage better. But to be only us, I think that at least for this exercise in the mind, little bit, I believe, I don't know the other Jose Divine that are part of this, let's say, design group. <laughs> if it makes sense to advance, to improve the format, to try, because it depends also from the calendar of everybody. But definitely, I believe that I made personally a progress in understanding the approach of a food environment on the consumption side. The entrance is to make a focus on the people and not on the food. Then come all the problem, no? Because we don't have here the other they are working on culture and social. No, but I, I believe that we cannot, uh, uh, that is feasible to do. That is only the second one with the various contingent. But I would like also to hear more, uh, if it's possible, from Divine. Uh, and what do you think, and to say thanks? You know, uh, for me, I mean, it's um, there was no there, there was no cookie cutter uh, model to follow. You know, this thing had to be designed and then tested. But I think maybe where we need to modify a little bit is the way we structure the sessions. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't diverge very much from uh, the points that you uh, listed here but probably begin the meeting by confirming out of what is listed a number of uh, three or four issues on which you would then identify how the collaborative framework needs to work, who is doing what, and who needs to be connected with what. I think that's, to me, what is missing, how we move towards that multi-stakeholder platform. I think that's what we are still a little bit yeah. uh, developing the theoretical discussions. I, I think we should limit ourselves to what is here. It's probably not exhaustive, but it's also okay to move forward to the next stage. We cannot redo a Palermo conference again here. I, I sense that we are doing that a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I agree with Divine, and uh, maybe for the next for the next session, Hi maybe. There. Welcome to the next speak. Okay, <laughs> maybe we can uh, identify already from the beginning these three four points and focus on what can be done about it, but also on the trade off because I think uh, and now in the end uh, this this trade off with the example of the. 
of the plastic and uh, and convenience and there are so many uh, trade-offs between the different sessions no and this is what was the idea I think at the beginning uh, the, in the last session also okay there was a discussion but it was a continuation of the Palermo discussion I I wasn't there but I from what I yeah. see in the in the in the conclusions so how the, the the challenge here is how to put those sessions together and analyze what are the trade-offs between the use of water and uh, and more uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, for example. Uh, so yes, I, maybe maybe for next sessions, this this poses a challenge also in terms of the participants whether it would be it would have to be a mix uh, a mix. Um, uh, group of participants from different sessions, but uh, yeah, it's as as it was said. And this trade-off uh, analysis is one of the com more complex uh, things that we have uh, uh, ahead. So also maybe focusing on concrete actions. For example, it was mentioned the public procurement as one of the possible actions that could encompass different of the of the aspects that we were discussing today. So, starting identifying possible actions that can uh, pull on different of these uh, uh, these current trade-offs, I think that would be that would be much more yeah. actionable in the end, not for the platform, because in the end, it's what what is the platform going to be working uh, on as a priority? No. Yeah. I was I was in Palermo and I was probably in a parallel working session because the, the logistics means you have to break things apart. But we are all working towards the systems approach. So it's absolutely logical that even if we have specific entry points and discussions that come to conclusions, the other groups will be doing the same and hopefully we are all moving towards something that will make sense together. So I wouldn't be too worried. To go back, is that what we said in that particular session? But I would really, on the other hand, be looking out for ways that could lead and would be of common interest in other sessions, because that's where the systems approach will appear. And focusing on concrete things, what can we do? I think we should forget, I mean, use what has been written, what's been agreed upon as entry point for discussion, but then not let ourselves be stuck by it. It's only a certain number of people that did a great job in a limited amount of time. There's many other people. So let's see concretely how we can get to the non-Palermo participants. How can we link that into and then make sure that the thinking we came up through and the one we're following up on can actually lead to this common approach for the Mediterranean. Yeah. And so maybe my last point, if I may. Yeah. It's just that I think we we'll probably need a little bit more work yeah. in preparing for the sessions to get to, yeah. to have this kind of discussion that we're talking about. Yeah. I think we we'll, we'll need to week, we can more work, more exchanging of documents, and then agreeing yeah. on those you know those key things that you yeah. you know we discussed yeah. and probably sorted out I agree totally, during yeah. the more limited time we have. It's not possible next week. It, if I may, Sandro, you may remember that I, I was suggesting to arrive to that meeting not with the results of Palermo, but with something different. And I understand the willingness not to lose what has been done in Palermo and to be very, to have, because it's a way also to conserve all the people. But I think we, one of the biggest difficulty we have in advancing a discussion, especially starting from the, directly from the outcome of Palermo, is that what we are trying to do now is to go from understanding knowledge to action, which is something particularly difficult for most of the actors that were in Palermo. Their place to be is academia, knowledge, bringing understanding, and this is what we have done for a long time. So, and 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 it's it it's it, one of the things that show that is that Florence is much more at her ease here because she has been advocating action for a long time. So 
I really think that it would be much easier for the next conversations if somebody, maybe two or three persons, take the conclusions of one session or two or three sessions and say, hey, what does this mean for me in terms of action? And to extract two or three things that can be circulated before with other people and then are brought and discussed. Because if, if you look how this session has gone, what has been so helpful is that there was this mention of focus on the person because it gives an orientation to action. It gives a motivation for collective, for public authorities, for, so I think it is these kind of things that we need to find in the conclusions of other sessions, having really in mind <coughs> action as, as the objective, which also means identification of actors and also possibly conflicts of interest, uh, constraints, potential trade-offs, identifying some of the catalytic points where we want to act. And, and this would trigger a different kind of discussion than the one that we have, that we had in the sessions in Palermo, but which to a very great extent, we already had in Palermo in the corridors, in the coffee breaks and during the meals. Yeah. Sandra, would you agree with such a way to do things? Because we are at the end, I would like to ask it to Gianluigi Cardone if he has something, he was part of the session, never spoke, he had something to say, because then I believe that uh, we have to thank Gian Piero Mazzocchi, Francesca Forno, that they were part of this new uh, this way to proceed and not to stay in the memory of how it was Palermo, but we are already moving after this second experiment after Palermo by recasting the format and trying to understand. This will also initiate a closer collaboration with FAO. This web dialogue we are initiated by Sian Bari, and then we are really consolidated the relationship in the content with FAO, that was also to Monday when we will start to collaborate together in the format as well as with the UPM in a later stage. So this is a moment in which we can really start to better focus. I don't know if Gianluigi Cardone has something to say before that also we close. Uh, for me, uh, today, uh, I uh, like to uh, understand uh, the, uh, the, the mission of this uh, dialogue because uh, uh, I was uh, uh, out for this uh, uh, process and uh, I, I am available to give uh, my and our colleagues uh, to contribute to the discussion. Uh, of course, the, uh, in this uh, uh, basket there are a lo uh, many uh, issues and it's very uh, difficult for me uh, to uh, synthesize what is the priority uh, for the future uh, if we want to uh, collect uh, different uh, um, ideas uh, from different uh, and uh, this is a multi multiplicatory uh, approach. Uh, for me, I want to uh, understand more uh, the uh, mission of the discussion uh, for give uh, our contribution to finalize uh, uh, the uh, aims uh, to after the Palermo conference. For example, I um, like to give more attention to the promotion of the typical products because uh, the link between the median diet and the territory for me is a uh, is very interesting uh, the uh, explain to consumer the awareness of the customer about uh, the added value of the typical products and of course uh, speaking about the sustainability uh, 
the customer uh, wants to uh, have more uh, uh, clear and uh, guarantee about the origin of the products because sometimes there are fraud, there are problems to uh, is clear the uh, origin and the quality and of course uh, the sustainability uh, products. For this uh, I want to uh, give more attention to these aspects to link uh, between the territory and the local products, typical products. Just a minor thing, but we're talking food environments. I'm sorry, I should have talked before uh, Dalia left. Uh, but this is one of the things that the people working on nutrition are looking at very seriously now. And again, like public procurement, this is something that is interagency from the UN side. And, and it is a challenge. And where, where I come there is that when we're talking FAO and WHO in the Mediterranean, well, it's also the people in the Cairo office and the people, um, well, especially I think the Cairo office is, and you have WHO, which is in Alexandria. And Alexandria and, and Cairo are probably the ones that have been working on some of those issues from the FAO side. When I, before I retired, no, after I retired, I went to Tunis on a meeting organized by the Cairo office on food security. And then we're doing quite a lot of work there. So I think it's really important also not to lose our people from the regional offices because they have a lot to bring on what we're doing. Sure. Alexander, do you want to close you? Um, but, uh, to you yeah, so br briefly, I think there are two different points. The, the first one is we agreed on a certain number of important principles that can drive action in the future that will need to be carefully worded uh, using the text from where we started but only as a starting point having in mind uh, the objective i would say to deliver two to three broad principles uh, using the food environment not that as an end in itself but as a mean to potentially transform food systems for more sustainability of food systems and, and more sustainable diets. So that's probably one, one first conclusion. Uh, there was a second big conclusion that was more related to how to conduct these e, these e dialogues. And uh, with globally the idea that even if we're starting from what has been said in, in Palermo, it has to be reprocessed in order to be an easier start from a discussion towards more action and to better merge various sessions as much as possible. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody for the very rich discussion. Uh, and I'll see with John Luca, how to proceed, and with Sandro, on how to proceed to make this wording and circulate it in an appropriate time and way. Sandro, do you want to add something? Thanks very much, and uh, we will be in touch how we continue. Thank you. Giampiero, you want to say something? Oh, okay, well. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. That's ciao, it. ciao. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. 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 Vicky, caricate il video. Guardateci il video che è importante, per favore. Va bene, sarà fatto. Grazie. Bye. 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 Bye.